Well, good morning, Southside. I like that enthusiasm. Um, I hope you were blessed during the holidays, but this is truly one of my favorite times of the year because we leave December behind and we reach forward to what lies ahead to enter in a new year fresh with desires for deeper growth in Christ, to know Him more fully, to love Him deeper, and to live into the fullness of His gospel. Looking at the flock and seeking God in ways how to help Him grow this year and asking His blessing in that way. I just love a new year. So 2023, sorry. What a beautiful song that was. So I'm excited about where the Lord has us for this season as a church. We're in Romans chapter 12, if you're visiting. So if you'll turn there, we're going to be looking at 30 imperatives of the new life in Christ. God exhorting his children to love and good deeds. How to offer up my body a living sacrifice to him, to study together and to pray and seek the spirit for transformation, metamorphosis in each one of our lives this year to walk the highway of holiness together hand in hand and shoulder to shoulder and shield to shield. And so I want to open with a word of prayer. Before I do, just one quick announcement. Um, The Young Marrieds Community Group is going to be going through Paul David Tripp's material, uh, one session on marriage over in here and one session on parenting for 10 weeks I think he's one of the best teachers on the subject alive today on the earth. He's gospel-centered and grounded in grace, and he will be instructing us through videos. And then um, we'll meet at the church on Thursday evenings. Uh, The videos will start at 6.30 promptly, and then we'll have some discussion and prayer together, uh, hoping to end at 7.30 for your little babies. I think we had 15 babies born to the church last year. So our, our view of church growth is... Happy families. Happy families. Um, so we need child care. We'd like to provide uh, child care, Lord willing. So if there's anyone in here who would like to be paid and help these uh, parents be able to focus and, and just kind of watch over some little ones, I want you to reach out to me and come see me. We're working on that. So I'd like to invite any young marrieds or parents who are not currently in the community group Uh, If you want to be a part of that, communicate with me because we'll be ordering the workbooks this week. And then the question I get asked often is, what about older marrieds? And I say, hallelujah. And we're in some of the initial stages of a a class of how to grow in that. Uh, JD and Cindy Hatter have been led of God to help us journey in that. So I thank God for them. So the infomercial is over. And now I just want to pray with my brothers and sisters before we open the word of God. Father, I come before you, and I thank you that we get to worship you now through the word of God. I thank you for what we look at this morning that has gone deep into my own heart, and I just pray that you'll do that now in my brothers and sisters as we open the word of God. Lord, you know what every heart needs. And I pray that by your spirit, you would apply this word perfectly to each heart. Lord, do what only you can do. And we rejoice that we have the Holy Spirit who can do those things in each heart now through this word. And so I pray that I would not get in the way at all of what you desire to do in our lives this morning. I pray that you would be worshiped and adored. And it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Well, Romans chapter 12, we made a big transition from our study for many years on the gospel. And Paul now comes and says, therefore, in light of this glorious gospel, and I told you this morning, one of the sweet saints, as she was walking in, just said, how you doing? And she said, I'm doing so good. I was an enemy of God. And through the work of Jesus Christ alone on the cross, he's reconciled me now. And 
I'm, I'm his, really, I'm a daughter of God. I'm reconciled. And he intercedes, praying for me that I will make it to the end in glory. And this is, a, I think she's walked with God for decades. And just the gospel overtaking her heart. And then I walked up to her after Sunday school and said, thank you for lifting my heart so beautifully. And, and I said, my heart's you know, been worked this week. And she said, well, what are you preaching on? And, and I told her, verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. And she just said, you know, I've never, ever been able to do that in my own strength. I've never been able to love without hypocrisy. Without Jesus, I'm all hypocrisy. And just the, the joy of to say only God can do this. And that's why there's a therefore, because this is only for the children of God who know this gospel, live into it, and believe it, that this is now what, where God is going to lead us as the children of God. And so that's where we will go this morning. We want to offer up our bodies a living sacrifice to God. God, here's my life. Let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee, I don't want to be conformed to this world, which everything about this world is hypocritical love. I, I don't want to be like this world. But I want to be transformed by the renewing of my mind and truth. I want to be metamorphosed from the inside to the out to become a man who loves without hypocrisy like Jesus Christ, who perfectly did that when he walked this earth. And so this morning then, we, we, we looked at the, the body of Christ, that we enter into it, we're, we're unified in him, we're one. We don't come in with high-mindedness about ourselves, we come in in humility, we wash feet, and we use our gifts to help each other grow up into the head. And now Paul's going to transition this morning into verse 9, and he's going to say, let love be without hypocrisy. And so we begin verses 9 through 21, and again with these 30 imperatives. And before I begin, I just want to prepare our hearts for the section that we're going to journey together as a church. And my question to you is, what do you do with a section like this, with these bullets and imperatives and commands that are going to come at us in rapid fire? Do you just... Have a quiet time and you, you read them. I, I timed it. It takes about a minute to read them. And you kind of read them and you just get up and your life is transformed. I hear a few chuckles because I think you're like me. And, and it doesn't work that way. All of a sudden those ethics and virtues just flow out of my life. Thanks, Paul. That's all I needed. I'm ready to go. But in my personal experience in shepherding the flock of God, it just doesn't seem to work like that. And since getting COVID, if I can remember one of these imperatives after reading them all, that's a good day for me. And so I kind of pull out, I'm saying, Paul, why do you, what are you writing? What do you want the people of God now to do with Romans 12? How do you want to help us? I want to offer up my body a living sacrifice, and these commands are, are a part of that. So how does this help me give a whole-souled offering to God? How will this section help me? Because you know by now, some of you at least, I'm not a big fan of lists. And I, I, I know a couple of my elders have always been like, you, you got to get over that issue. And the reason is because I... I used lists wrongly, and I've shepherded people who use lists wrongly. So quickly, we, 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 we just get back into it, and it's your new Ten Commandments, and you, I'm going to check this off, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and that isn't going to get you to holiness. The Holy Spirit, though, gives them throughout scriptures. So I got to get over my list issue, because God gives lists. So the problem can't be lists. It's what my flesh likes to do with them is what the problem is. And so I'm trying to head you off at the past and not do what I do. And so my question is, is how does God want to use these lists in Romans 12? What's your purpose? Which will only be for our good and for others and for transformation and worship of God. So don't run from lists. At least biblical lists. Run from... This is what I'm looking for in a spouse that's 10 pages long. Throw those away. But let me try to help as we begin this list. 
I want to shepherd you into the joy and the delight of God's lists and the transformation that can come from them. And so I want to come back into the context. I want to spend some time this morning because we're going to flow through this for months. And we've already seen some lists <coughs> in Romans, haven't we? Back in Romans 1 through 3, there was the list of depravity, and he was showing us characteristics of depravity and what it will look like and how you'll behave and how you will act. And then in Romans 3, 9 through 18, rapid fire. There's none righteous. There's none good. Not even one. And the, and the goal was that you would see your portrait there. That list was so that you couldn't hide and say, you know, I'm not that bad. I, I just got a bad cold, so to speak. And he wants you to see your face in that and realize you're a dead corpse and you can do nothing to make yourself acceptable to God. And that list left me just hanging and broken and in need. When I got done with that list, I could never look at my own hands and say, I'm going to go be a good guy. That list did its work deep in my heart. And as I learned about depravity in the fall, to have that list just finished me off for a justification through faith in Christ alone. It served me well. And now we come to a list in Romans 12. And this list is, is a portrait of the redeemed. That was a list of the portrait of the depraved. And now this is the portrait of redeemed children of God who have a therefore. Those who have found Jesus Christ to, to take that enmity and bring you into a relationship with God through his work. It's not the list of the Ten Commandments. Go keep these to try to get right with God. This is how we love now because we're right with God. This list is not the law to tutor you to Christ. Though some of you this morning could be tutored to Christ through this list. You might walk out of here saying, my whole life is hypocrisy. That's all it is. And this list this morning might show you that you need a Savior to be saved from all hypocritical love that has characterized your whole life. And so it could do that to you this morning. But for the children of God, it's not a list to try to obey to get His favor. It's a list because you are in Christ and loved by God to renew your mind to know what is the will of God for your life as a son or daughter who is justified in the presence of God. So I'm begging you, don't use it as law to beat yourself up and come out here saying, I'm not even a Christian. I got to work harder at these. That's what I'm wrestling you with. But I want you to renew your mind to offer up your body a living sacrifice in this way. This is the path of the redeemed. This is how the children of God walk. This is the law of Christ. The law of Christ, how to love others practically. And so this is for me to slow down and learn what it says and renew my mind in these areas because this is the, the heading, let love be without hypocrisy, and, and the rest of these will flush that out, what that looks like in detail. But seeking transformation to be these kind of lovers in the body of Christ. So my question then is, how do I get transformation in this section? And not just beat down and left bleeding with no hope. Because honestly, either could happen because of what I say wrongly or because of what you hear. And so I, I'm praying and seeking God and being checked to say this as clear as I possibly can, to not use it as law to beat you. But sometimes, no matter what you hear, and I lived in this, it's always a list to your heart because the gospel hasn't set you free. So every time you hear any of these, it will go back to your list that you got to work on to be accepted by God. And so that's what can go on here during this season. So one of my favorite mentors really helped me in my thinking in this section because he asked some of the questions that I've been asking. And he said, let's, let's um, let Paul answer this question for us. <laughs> Isn't that probably a good place to go instead of anywhere else? Paul, what, why are you, what are you doing this 
for? What do you want us to get from it? And if you flip over to Romans 15, I think he tells us at the end of it <coughs> what we need to get from this. And I want you to look at Romans 15:15. 15, 15. Paul says, I've written very boldly to you on some points. Yes, he has. So as to remind you again because of the grace that was given to me from God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God, God's gospel, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And so what I see going on here is this, there's only one way that you'll ever get change, Paul's saying. And in verse 15, he says that it was the Word. And so the Word of God is, 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 is what we need. And he's been saying you need to renew your mind in it. But I want you to hear this. This might shake some of you. But the Word of God alone changes nobody. And I'll raise my hand and testify. When I just look at the Word in Romans 12 and try to go live it, I fail every time. You, the Word of God alone will not cause the metamorphosis that we're looking for in our lives, in our walk with God. And the second thing he said in verse 16 then is the Spirit of God. The Spirit is the one who will change you, but catch this, through His Word. He's going to use Romans 12, the Word of God, by the Spirit to transform and change us and, and to make it not be a list that you read and just say, that's nice, but you begin to start looking like this list. And so we need both. We need to linger over these words, and we're going to try to understand each one of them as we journey. we got to get the Word in our minds, and all of us be praying, Holy Spirit, change me. This morning, I want everyone praying, let me love without hypocrisy, Holy Spirit. To say, when I do it on my own, nothing has ever come out of it. Holy Spirit, as I understand this word this morning, change me and renew me and make me like this so that I can be an acceptable offering to you. So what could happen in these next months um, gets me out of bed excited for what God can do in our lives and in our hearts. I don't want to run out of time, but I asked another sweet lady before how she's doing. She said, I turn 80 and I'm doing good because God is so good. She said, I've learned that in the hard things he brings into my life and in the good things, he's beautiful, he's worthy of praise, he's worthy to be worshiped, and all I want to do is love. And I was like, man, that's the kind of stuff. You, you, you can go home. You don't even need to listen to Romans 12, sweetheart. But everything that I want us to become, that's who she is. Thank you. And so let's go to the list in Romans 12. <coughs> Augustine said this, Lord, command what thou will and grant what thou commandest. And so I'm going to show you in Romans 12 what he commands I want to look to God and say, will you grant to me what you command in the gospel of Jesus Christ? May God grant it to every believing heart now as we journey. Let's dig in. After I pray. Father, I thank you for 2022. God, your mercies were new every morning. Your grace was sufficient. And I watched you meet so many in this body in mighty powerful ways in their trials and in their sufferings and their unbelief and difficulties and all the things that they battled. God, we join in one voice and one heart and we praise you. You were so faithful to us. God, we love you. We thank you for this gospel that has made us acceptable to you and we are loved by you. And so I just thank you for all that you did in 2022. And Lord, as we lift our eyes and look forward to a new year, Lord, every one of us have this burning desire. I want to offer up my body a living, pleasing sacrifice to you. And I want to be metamorphosed. I want to be changed. And, and so we look to you, God, in this year to change so many things about us that don't look like Jesus. 
Lord, that you will keep transforming us from one image of glory to the next. I pray that you will use these imperatives in mighty ways in conforming us to Christ. God, we thank you for the beauty of these commands. And it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. So the outline for our section is we don't have one. Sorry. I found it so difficult. I kept trying and trying, and the ones I would get I didn't like, and I checked other people's outlines, and my conclusion is it just doesn't outline very easy. You know what it feels like to me? The Proverbs. Try outlining the Proverbs. It's bullets of wisdom, and if you study anything, it's all over Proverbs, and you learn. I, I think these are standalone statements. They're, there's just not a nice orderly argument. I don't think there's as much of a logical sequence as there has been perfectly through Romans. Uh, but I just thought, hey, life comes at us uh, not in sequence and not in a straight line. There's much variety, much like the section that is before us. So Paul is going to shoot these ethical machine gun bullets at us. They're present participles with the force of command. And so we need to take them up. And my first one I'm going to call the supreme directive. This is the one that the rest of them hang upon. This is, that's why we're going to spend all morning on this supreme directive let love be without hypocrisy. And I need you to hold still while I stick the scalpel in this morning to cut off flesh that has grown over our hearts and hypocritical love. And it's, it, it's painful, but it's profitable. And so may God do his work in our midst. So I want to start with this first word, let. There's actually a lot to this word. Why is Paul commanding believers to love without hypocrisy? Wasn't that in Romans 2 what he attacked the Pharisees for and he exposed their hypocrisy and their unbelief? He says, you, you teach, don't, don't commit adultery while you commit adultery. You're, you're teachers of the law while you don't keep the law. And, it, and it's what he showed then in chapter 2. But what, we have, what have we seen about this world? Don't be conformed to this world and if I had to summarize the world, it's a love filled with hypocrisy. To enter into this world is just hypocritical love on every turn. It, it uses people. Its best acts come from wrong motives, to be approved by men or to be approved by God. This world is just characterized by hypocritical love, and, and it's why we all came out so broken and hurt and continue to be because of this hypocritical love. But now in Romans 3.21, we have received the love of God in Christ Jesus. We have received God's love in Christ Jesus. And we sit here this morning with no condemnation upon us because Jesus took every last drop of your condemnation on the cross. Nothing will ever be able to separate you from his love. And he puts a new heart within us that now loves because he first loved us. There is a new heart in the child of God that for the first time can love without hypocrisy. And then you'll remember back, if you want to even turn to it, Romans 8, 1 through 4, I want to remind you of our journey so that we can stay in context. And verse 1, there is therefore right now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, not even a drop. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. You're, you're no longer under that law. Jesus has set you free from sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, it could never get you out from under that. So God did it sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and in, as an offering for sin on the cross, God condemned sin, my sin in the flesh of his son. And here's the Hena clause for the purpose of what? That the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And to go back to that when we studied it, is now for the first time I can love without hypocrisy. 
I can keep the requirement of the law, which was to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. By that work on the cross and the gospel, I can be set free to love for the first time. We can keep that part of the law, to love God and to love others from the heart. Paul is commanding believers to not let their love be hypocritical. And I think this is big because Romans 7, in my understanding, was Paul battling flesh as a mature child of God, saying the good I want to do, I don't. The things I hate, I keep doing. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? that we said sin was no longer reigning, but it, it remains. And so all of that hypocritical love that characterized us in our flesh is still, it, it remains, and it needs to be put to death by the Spirit. But I want you to hear this. I have remaining sin that loves hypocritically in my heart this morning. I hate it. We need to be exhorted in this because we're so prone to it in our flesh. One of our greatest battles to love hypocritically. One of my greatest battles because it's at the root of what needs to be mortified by the Holy Spirit within us. I need him to be killing the sin of hypocritical love. I can't do it. I need the Spirit of God, as I believe this gospel, to be putting this to death in my heart. Philippians 1.9, Paul said, I, This I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so you can improve the things that are excellent, so you can be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. Paul says, I pray that you're going to grow in real knowledge, epinosis, full knowledge, and discernment. And so the child of God is going to keep renewing his mind and grow in how to discern how to love God and love others. We're going to keep growing in this as the word works and shows us. And I mean, Romans 12 is going to show us and teach us discernment for how to love this new love that God's put in my heart well. And so guys, I renew my mind and my love abounds still more and more. When I got married to my wife almost 34 years ago, there was a genuine love for her. And what I've learned in 34 years is more and more how to love her. And I, I stunk at it. And just, it wasn't because I didn't love her. I didn't know how. And as the Spirit of God and the Word keeps teaching me and experience, I'm learning new things that I, I did not even know how to love her back then. And so you're, you're growing in real discernment and knowledge and how to love one another. And so that's it. And, and shepherding, when we started this church, there was such a love for this body and I didn't know how to love it. I had to keep growing and learning. And I stand here today saying, I'm still trying to learn how to love and shepherd this body. God keeps teaching me and I'm learning and I'm, I want to I be so much better and improved. My love abounding more and more. But I just want you to see you keep growing and you keep learning how to love the way God loves. And here's Romans 12 saying, here's how I want you to love Renew your minds and seek the Spirit of God to become these kind of men, women, and children. And I will die in Romans 7 that I'll, the last breath I breathe, I'm still going to have hypocritical love in this body. And that is just, I hate it. I just do. I hate it. And I'm asking God to remove it and in every one of you, that he would do that work in Southside Bible Church.
And so the Word of God, this gospel, keeps growing in my mind and my heart, and I'm working it out in different ways in my thinking and in my attitudes. Teach me how to love. Renew my mind in the Word, believing this gospel for the metamorphosis that will be agape for God and for others. Amen? I'm going to go home. No way. No way. Um, uh, that's, that was our first word, let. Our second word is love. Let love. What Greek word do you think it is? Gape. Hey, Tom. Gape. It's important. This is the word that is used to describe God's love for us. It's the word used to describe Christ's love by dying on a cross for us. And so there's different Greek words for love. One is eros, and it's seeing something attractive and desiring it. Philos is a brotherly love. It's kind of this bond and common interest that we have, and we're to have that for one another. Storge is a natural affection, like blood ties and family, a father, a son. But this is agape. The commentator Lenski said it's a love that comprehends its purposes. It purposes to act of the will to do all that it can for the object. And so it, it's, it's informed, it understands, and it, it says, I'm going to act for this object for its good no matter what I get in return. No matter what I get in return, the love of God was that way to me. And that's what agape is. It, it, it can only come from God. Human beings will never be able to produce agape. That's why the law tutors you to Christ because it demands agape. And no one will ever be able to give it. It is God's love. And it must flow then through His Holy Spirit if it will ever flow into our lives to others. It doesn't consider itself. It's a self-giving love. It doesn't seek its own satisfaction. It strives for the highest good of the other. It seeks no return. It doesn't give to get. It, it is just, I want you to hear this. It's simply concerned with giving. The focus is bettering its object rather than enriching itself. So do you see why it was reserved only for God's love to, to us and to Christ? Yet this is what the believer has been saved into. You've been saved into this love. This is what then is to flow from our heart when we comprehend the love of God in Christ Jesus. And it's why he said in Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The agape of God and what he's done in this gospel has been shed into our hearts. And that is where this begins and where it flows. And so you see, so you see why it is reversed. <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, this is the fruit of the Spirit that now resides within us, the Holy Spirit. So you can't work it, you can't labor it. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us to love. And He can produce this fruit by the power of the gospel and by abiding in Jesus Christ. And from that is where this is going to flow. It'll never be your natural strength or resource it can only come from God, the Holy Spirit, who dwells within us. All Christian virtue is summed up in love. The Pharisees heard that Jesus had put the Sadducees to silence. They gathered themselves together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And upon these two things hangs the whole law. So the whole law is summed up. Love God with all your being and love your neighbor as yourself. I'm just going to read in the next chapter, Romans 13, 8. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. 
For this, here's the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And so this is what God desires from us. This is the core and the root that all behavior will flow from. This is the fountain of grace and the capstone. This grace that all other uh, behaviors will flow out of. One Puritan said, it's the girdle that holds all the other graces together. I don't even know what a girdle is, so some of you older people are going to have to teach us. So the Spirit, working love in the heart, is more excellent than all the extraordinary gifts in Corinthians. They were speaking in tongues, you know, prophesying, uh, all the things that were going on. And he said, there's a more excellent way I want to show you. Agape. To love. Right back to the same context in Romans 12. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. That's the Therefore. You love the way I have loved you, but you also love one another. And by this, all men will know you're my disciples if you have agape for one another. That's the badge. They'll know because it's the opposite of this world. And Paul says this love is eternal. Graces like faith and hope, he said, are going to cease in heaven but love will never end. And he says his love for us will never end. And in 1 Corinthians 13, our own love never fails. Whatever comes up against it, love has to triumph. So my question to you this morning, how can anyone have agape? How can anyone ever fulfill the law of God? And Romans 3, 19 through 22 We were taught that the law comes and it says to love God and love your neighbor as yourself and no one will ever be able to keep it. No one will ever be able to do that. If you're here trying to do that, I've got great hope for you. It wasn't designed for you to be able to do it, but to fail and come to the rest of the gospel in Romans 3.19 that Jesus came and he did fulfill that. And he went up on a cross for all of our loveless acts. And he died on that cross and received the wrath that our sins deserved. And so now God declares you right with him, justified outside of your law keeping, but by his. And then he'll shed abroad in his heart, his love, your hearts, his love. And in Romans 7, just quickly, I'm reminding you of where we've journeyed. In verse 4, therefore, my brethren, you were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. And if you die to the law, how are you not going to just be lawless? You must die to the law so that you might be joined to another, the Lord Jesus Christ, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. And so if I'm ever going to bear fruit for God, I die to the law. I die to myself trying to be good enough to earn his favor. I just believe the bare gospel that he did it all. And the salvation is free. It's of grace. It can't be taken away. It makes me right with God. I finish that and I'm joined to another. I'm married to Jesus. And this marriage will produce fruit. A fruit called love will come from that relationship. So Ten Commandments doesn't produce love. You know what it actually produces? Lovelessness. It makes you a Pharisee. It makes you judgmental. It makes you just sad and angry because you can't measure up. It produces lovelessness. So you must die to the law. God's done it all. It's finished. Be joined to Jesus in this beautiful love relationship. And the fruit that comes from that relationship is called love. And we've been saved to love by a miracle of grace. And I'm going to use this illustration. I've used it before um, 
from kind of a famous preacher, but I, I find if I say people's names anymore, it flips everybody. So just a great preacher. <laughs> and it's not original with me. And his summary of that, he says, I want you to picture a house. And this house has a front door and a back door. And he says that when you come inside the house, it's just a whole treasure of love. It's how Jesus loved. He loved God with his heart, mind, soul, and strength, his neighbor as himself. That's what's inside this house, just love. And the question is, how do I get into it? I, I want to enter into that house. And so you come to the front door, and there's a padlock on the front door. And he says, so you walk up to it, and one click to the left, thou shall not covet. One click to the left, thou shall not steal. Thou shall not commit adultery. Thou shall not lie. And he says, no one has ever gotten through that door. You come to it and you die at that door every time. That won't get you into the love that we're looking at this morning. Law works. They're not going to get into this house. The commandments can't get you in there. But there's a back door. And you must die to the front door where you quit trying to get in through your works. And that door is Jesus Christ came into the world and he died on a cross for your sins. And he was buried on the third day. He was raised again to show that he won the victory and death has been defeated and your sin has been conquered. Romans 1 through 11. And now he takes you and he carries you in through the back door. And you have to love him and trust him and believe in him. And he carries you into that house where love is. So by being in his arms and united to Jesus, you enter into that house and you experience what love is, the fulfillment of the law. And so we must be attached to a person and not a list. You don't walk in and say, thank you, Jesus, you brought me into this house and now I get to just run and love and just, I got it. It's going to be by abiding in Him, believing the gospel, growing in the gospel, walking with Him, communing with Him. I, I can't go do this on my own. He brings me in, but it's by being in relationship with Him that this love will ever spring up. And so you can't leave Jesus and the gospel as believers if you ever want this love. You, you believe and you abide, you stay with Him. You grow in this gospel and, and organically, this love bubbles up. You never get over how you got in. That door cost Jesus Christ his life and bearing the wrath of God for me. That caused him to leave heaven and be incarnated into a baby and be rejected and hated. I can't get over the door. And that, by abiding in him, produces the love that we're going to look at. And by this, you wind up fulfilling the law by being in relationship to Jesus Christ. And so you can't leave him at the door. And so let me give you 30 commands of Romans 12 who are in this house, loved by God and accepted, and wanting to stay and abiding with Jesus that the Spirit might bear this kind of fruit in our lives. Why do I bring this all up again? Because love is what God wants from us. The fruit of our salvation is that we can love now in Romans 8. You can love for the first time and you can grow in it. What blessed freedom. Thank you for letting me grow and learning how to love you. And Laura, for learning how to love you. Thank you. From the bonds of self to the freedom of to love. So Paul says, let love be without hypocrisy. It's an interesting word. We get to go to our next word. Let agape not have hypocrisy. And it's an interesting Greek word. It, it meant without a mask. And we've talked about it before, but in the, those days when, when, the, when the Greeks would act, they had these little faces and happy one, you'd take it off and you'd put on a sad one. So when they were doing the plays, you had these little masks that would show emotions or whatever it was. 
And what it meant was you, you were showing the audience something that you, you weren't on the inside. You, you put a mask on to look something, but it's not what you really are on the inside. It, it meant to play a role, to just act. And he says, don't do that in your love. The Latin word, it, it was sincera. And it meant without wax. And it was the practice of in that day, they would take pottery, and if it had cracks, they would fill it with wax and try to sell it like it was the real deal without broken things. And the quality ones, if you held up to the sun and there were no cracks in it, they would put on it sincera, which meant without wax. It's, it's real. It's not fake. It's not covered over with wax. And so Paul says, don't fall into the spirit of the age being conformed to this world where your love becomes phony, hypocritical, gossips while smiling, disingenuous, plastic, verbal only, utilitarian, I just use other people. It's essentially saying what we are in our new man or woman. This is what we are as we behold Christ. Love that way. Love like God does. On Christmas Eve, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Love like Christ. Throw out. I've been praying for you when you have it been thinking about you right when you walked up. How you doing? And before you even answer, they're gone. One that I've been wanting to talk to you about for 24 years, interrupting one another. When we're talking, don't serve, complain the whole time. I'm throwing out examples so you can understand possibilities of your heart. Hospitality where you're put out because they got food on your carpet. Love only the pretty people. Them with power, influence, where you can get a benefit from them. Love as a Pharisee, trying to be approved by God, trying to be approved by others. Let your love be sincere, without wax, heartfelt. Peter says, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. So don't give actor kind of love is what he's saying. Are you with me? This is the one who has been saved and joined to Christ and your heart has been melted now to love people. And I just want to express the love that Christ has given to me for remaining sin, fighting this command. It will just be a love that wants to give. Paul says this, love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous, it does not brag, it's not arrogant, it does not act unbecomingly, <clears throat> it doesn't seek its own, it's not provoked, it doesn't take into account a wrong suffered, it does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but it rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, anything that comes up against it. It believes all things in one another. It hopes all things and it endures all things. And he says, love never fails. The the agape love, it can't die. So Paul says, let's get on with genuine, sincere love of the brethren and put off the phony baloney. And I got a bunch of examples, but I'm running out of time. Do you want metamorphosis or a mask? 
I want to love without hypocrisy versus faking it. My question all week is, why does the hypocrite do this? And in your community groups this week, maybe talk about it. And if you battle this deeply, I want you to ask your group to pray for you. And they won't kick you out. And you can be honest and say, this is where I struggle. This is where your pastor struggles. We have so much hope to mortify this by the Spirit within us, by faith, believing the gospel to start putting to death this hypocritical love that still resides in the believer's heart. But this imperative comes at me and it wakes me up from growing numb in hypocritical love and getting used to it and familiar with it. And it just comes and it just pierces because all I want to do is just the way he's loved me, I want to love that way. And it just came and it cut flesh off my heart. Thank you, God. So I'm going to close out with just a couple questions. Can anyone stand up to this command? And so I need to always remind you, there is one who did love perfectly. He's the only one who ever walked this earth. There was never even an ounce of hypocrisy in the way that Jesus loved. He did come and fulfill that law so that what God required was that so we could have that put to our account and we could stand in the presence of God. And so I just, I know there's some sitting here this morning still just taking these commands and trying to clean up and trying to be better and it's not working. And maybe this morning that this is such a heavy blow because your love is hypocritical. And it's, the, it's not, I struggle with this, this is who I am. And Jesus is offering, saying, come to me. Are you weary and tired of hypocritical love? Come to me and I will give you rest for your soul. I will make you right. I'll wash you and cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. And I'll make you right with me. Amen. And then I ask myself, how can I grow in this? And the first thing I've learned in my journey, there's just no power in let your love not have hypocrisy. It's never changed me. How do I grow in this? And Romans 7 told us, you have a new marriage. Love your bridegroom. Devote your life to knowing Jesus Christ seeking His glory and His word, believing His promises, depending upon Him, trust in Him, see Him, walk with Him, rest with Him, be controlled by Him. And the fruit is going to be loving people. If you want to be like Christ, go to Christ. 2 Corinthians 3, their minds were hardened for until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it's removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a man turns to the Lord Jesus, the veil is taken away. And now the Lord is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And where the Holy Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. There's freedom to love. But we all with unveiled face, beholding it as a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being metamorphosed, same Romans 12, 2, and to the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. And this, by the Spirit keeps showing us Jesus and the beauty. And I behold him. The fruit's going to be people who love. And you're going to love with agape. So don't turn away from Christ to a list. Don't make Romans 12 where I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps, and when we say, show hospitality, you're going to say, you know what? I'm going to show hospitality if it kills me. But you look at Christ until a desire to have people over and love them in your home bubbles up. This is a picture of how we offer our body up to Christ, not a law to make yourself do it. 
This is not a place to refine your list, and some of you are going to want to do that. Fight it. This is what Romans 12, 1 kind of offering looks like. This is what will flow from the one who is beholding the glory of Christ. And so I close out with what this did for me is it, it brought repentance. And that's what I would ask. And I've been reading this book and studying it and this guy had five steps to help in our repentance and I want to bring them up because it helped me a lot. So as we look at this command, the first step is acknowledge that you've sinned against God. God, my love is so hypocritical. I have loved you hypocritically. You're God and you're worthy. And I have loved you so hypocritically against you and you only I have sinned. Secondly, confess forms of false repentance. Fake repentance and selfish regret. Like, I can't believe I did that. Don't you understand the gospel? Of course. I, I know why I did it. I'm rotten. The core of my heart. I love what you said. Is Apart from Jesus, I will always love with hypocrisy. Of course I am. And don't say, I'm going to work on it. I'm going to get... I'm going to get better at this. That's a false repentance because you can't. You're not going to work at this and get better at it. Repent from false repentance. And then discern and repent the underlying heart motivations that drive you to that sin. And I think this could be one of the hardest things that take the most time. Is don't just say, I'm sorry that I said something so that someone would approve me. Instead of, why? Why am I so empty? What am I looking for from other humans that Christ isn't given? I, we got to get to the underlying motivation of what drove that sin and come before God with, with that. God, I'm repenting for this. And then number four, receive God's forgiveness by faith because of the work of Jesus Christ and that you're not under law, but you're under grace. So some of you run around saying, I don't want to abuse grace. And your problem is you won't use grace. You're, you won't be forgiven by if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse you of all your unrighteousness. I've got to come now. I believe mercy for everyone I share and talk with, except when I sin. And by faith, I believe that his blood has washed away my sin and cleansed me and restored me back into fellowship with God. Believe. And then fifthly, where we stop, rely upon God's power to turn away from this sin by faith, to purify our love. Not, I'm going to work harder. Holy Spirit of God, I need you to purify me as I believe this gospel and live. I need you to give me power to quit loving with hypocrisy. My strength has never been able to slay that giant. But the Holy Spirit of God can start killing hypocritical love by faith in Jesus Christ. And so, my prayer is that as a body, our love would be purified for Him and for each other. That we would grow in learning how to be led by the Spirit and what real true love is and quit being content with the hypocritical love. It's just don't, don't be satisfied with pharisaical external, staying away from Jesus kind of love and throwing sloppy stuff out to each other and using each other and to truly love to truly love with agape. And so I pray in the power of the gospel that God will bear that fruit by being married to Jesus Christ, being loved and accepted by his work. Let's pray. Father, burn it off by your Holy Spirit as we continue to behold Jesus Christ and see him in all of his beauty 
Lord, keep growing us in discerning love. Keep teaching us how to love each other better and well like Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you put the death in each one of us that we would get along with you and and cry out for the Spirit to put to death hypocritical love that my own strength can't stop. Lord, let there be dead hypocritical love laying all over the floor of this church. Kill it. Kill it by your Spirit as we look at Jesus and believe the fullness of all that He is for us. God, produce love that comes only from that. Purify our love for you. Purify our love for each other so that all men will know we're your disciples because we have love for one another. God, let repentance be deep in our hearts for living in this hypocritical love. God, forgive us and have mercy, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.